To get started, I was asked to describe what is biomedical engineering, because that really is going to underpin most of what I share with you this morning. So let me say that biomedical engineering is the interface between various disciplines. So on the left there, you see a whole variety of engineering disciplines, mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, civil engineering, computer engineering, biomedical engineering. So you can think of yourself as being an engineer. But likewise, you can think of clinical disciplines. So across the top, you see orthopedics, cardiology, obstetrics, pediatrics, trauma, ear, nose, and throat, etc. So really, what biomedical engineering is, is the intersection between any of those areas. So think of yourself, OK, let me ask Zach, name any of those engineering disciplines that you see on the left. Um, medical engineering, or me yeah, mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering. OK. Um, is it Riley Jones? Name any of those clinical areas. Pediatrics. Okay, so the, the suggestions we have from the audience is mechanical engineering and pediatrics. An example of where you would um, come up with a device that would fall under biomedical engineering that would cover both of those areas is in developing a fracture fixation plate that you would put on a pediatric patient who's broken his or her leg and design it in such a way that as the bone gets longer, the plate gets longer as well. So that's an engineering problem. How can you make a strong metal plate that you put in a person's fractured leg that would allow the person to get longer or taller as, as they got older? So that's one example. I, you know, I could go through the audience and I could ask you to name any engineering discipline or any clinical discipline, and I would come up with an example of biomedical engineering that covers those two areas, even civil engineering. <laughs> Most people think of civil engineers as people who design roads and bridges, well, believe it or not, there's a lot of civil engineering going on in medicine as well. So that's, uh, that's the field. What I'm going to share with you this morning are examples from the field of biomedical engineering that uh, hopefully will attract your interest and show you that there's a tremendous entrepreneurial um, opportunity here for, for people in Northeast Ohio, Ohio, or anywhere in the United States. In terms of the outline of the presentation today, I'm going to start off with an initiative called Best Medicine. I'll describe what that is. Then I'll go into an area called Value Driven Engineering. And this is an area where Northeast Ohio, and specifically Akron, is leading the nation in terms of this initiative. And I'll explain what that is. Then I'll talk about some uh, other biomedical engineering examples and finally end off with some challenges to hopefully spur your creativity uh, in the room today. So first of all, best medicine, and for those of you looking at this um, on the internet, uh, there's a website that you can go to to learn much more about this activity. But really, it's geared towards middle and high school students inventing things. So for, while you're sitting there, or after today, you can come up with an idea, um, and you present it. The whole, the whole focus of best medicine is to spur creativity and to have students come together in Akron at the National Inventors Hall of Fame School and show off their idea. So uh, unfortunately, the screen is in a, in a poor uh, lit area here, but I'll describe briefly the three areas, the three ways you can get into best medicine. And first of all, let me say the reason why you might want to get into best medicine is that every single student who takes part walks away with a prize, a financial prize. And we had this event the first time this year, and we gave away $16,000 worth of prizes including fully paid internships to work at the Austin Bio Innovation Institute in Akron. So, um, so there's something for everybody who attends this event. But the one way is to take part in the Northeast Ohio Science and Engineering Fair, or you can take part in the uh, district, the Western uh, Reserve District 5 Science Fair in Akron, or you can even have your own school science fair. And if you take part in that and if you're selected, you can then directly um, come and take part in best medicine. The second way is if your school is designated as a best medicine uh, school, and there are a few of them out there that are, that are, in particular, they are fully aware of what is needed to take part in a best medicine fair. Basically, you have to invent something, and, and it has to relate to medicine. And the last way on the right is simply, if you have your own idea, you can fill out some forms and submit it to us directly online. And if it's approved, 
um, then you'll be invited to take part as well. So it's a relatively straightforward process. Uh, if you have um, a problem that you can't think of ideas, we have about 150 ideas listed on our website. I'm just showing you a couple of examples on the screen here. Um, for those of you who cannot see the screen, I'll just say that they range from things like uh, aids for the handicapped, uh, if a person's in their home and they can't get into or out of the bath, invent some way of getting them in and out of the bath. Um, if they can't open uh, glass jars, come up with a method for helping them do that. It goes all the way to orthopedics and the example I mentioned earlier of designing a fracture fixation plate for pediatric patients, that's still an unmet need. There's no solution really out there yet that can do that and so that you, know, you can be creative and come up with something. So there are 150 ideas listed on our website and you can look at them and uh, take on one of those challenges. So here's a student from the, the event we had this year. He came up with an automatic pill dispenser because some people can't remember if they've taken the pill for uh, high blood pressure or diabetes. So this automatic pill dispenser, every day they came, you know, they'd come down to the kitchen for breakfast, there'd be a pill waiting for them to take. It'd be you know, something that would dispense automatically. Um, another example is a student, this is more of a 12th grade student. He worked in the area of nanoparticles um, at, at working with faculty at the, at the University of Akron. Um, nanoparticles are going to change the way medicine occurs in many respects. You can use them to, to treat cancer, even detect cancer. Uh, they can treat cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, these two students are from the Hudson area, um, two brothers. They looked at um, how adhesive tapes were. So if you think of a Band-Aid, how, how many of you put on a Band-Aid and then um, find out that a day later the thing is peeled off? And so they looked at the, at the adhes adhesive strength between a Band-Aid and skin. Uh, this student um, from somewhere in the Euclid area um, came up with a method for uh, fixing a fractured bone when the, person, when the patient also had a laceration. So clearly, if, if your arm is bleeding, you can't just put a plastic cast around it. Um, so it was a technique for solving two problems, the laceration as well as the fractured bone. So those are all examples of students who took part this year. Um, every student in your, in your um, handbook on your handout today has an example or a flyer from Best Medicine. And I would strongly encourage you to, um, to think about taking part in this event. It is, it's really a fun thing. You, you take, it starts in the morning on a Saturday morning, just like today. Uh, the one next year is on March 24th, and it's once again at the National Inventors Hall of Fame School in Akron. Um, so you start in the morning, the judging takes place in the morning, we have a, a keynote speaker at lunch, and you get your prizes straight after lunch. So you, from beginning to end, it's basically one morning, and, uh, and it's, it's very, you'll, you'll see a, a whole lot of creativity there, and a lot of those projects um, have commercial potential. Okay, so value-driven engineering. I want, to, I want to encourage everybody to think about this. The market for medical devices in the future is overseas. We need to solve problems that other countries are having with their patients, and we need to develop devices here in America and sell them overseas. This particular example was developed by GE for a population in India. Specifically, patients who are in a remote location, they don't have access to public transport, and so they developed this electrocardiogram device for allowing doctors to put this in, the, in their briefcase and go and visit the patients um, in India. That device is now so successful <laughs> that it's being used over here. But that's an example. If you, if you target markets overseas and solve some of the problems that they're having there, 
you can find markets for that same device over here in America. So this, this slide here says, um, is never ever think outside the box. And I'm gonna ask you to think outside the box right now. So think, you know, in this country we're fortunate to have a, a, a reliable and a steady water supply for every household in America. Think of a situation, maybe in Africa, where you don't have water. And you have to send one of your teenagers to go to the river and, and pick up water. If you think about that, the problem is water is a heavy thing to carry. And so could you come up with a device that you would sell overseas that would help um, people solve this problem of getting water for their households? And you have to be creative here. You have to think, if I design a big bucket, I'm limited by how much water I can put in because the, because the person has to carry that bucket. So they say never reinvent the wheel. However, sometimes it's a good thing to reinvent the wheel. This company came up with a container that had a hole through the center. And all you do is you fill it up with water, you pass a rope through it, and you just roll it to wherever you want to go. That's an example of creativity, and it's an example of designing something here that you can sell overseas. Because there are a lot of people who would like to fill up their water container and not have to carry it, but rather roll it to their home. That philosophy is, is part of value-driven engineering. It's, it's in, improving the value of something and diminishing the cost of it. So value is how useful it is divided by how much it's going to cost you. And there are many examples of this. As Zach mentioned when he was introducing me, I was born and raised in South Africa, and we were involved with developing some medical devices there that were for low resource settings. Here's an example of a device that I personally was involved with uh, developing. This particular patient had a disease where everything, their, their soft tissues became calcified. Their muscles and their skin became calcified. So they became very, very stiff. And the way to treat this was to keep their legs moving. So every day, all day long, this particular patient had to have her legs move backwards and forwards, both the left and the right. And if you did that for long enough, eventually the disease went away. But you had to do it for about a year and a half. And I think electricity in this particular case was an issue. So how can you develop a machine that would move a person's legs backwards and forwards and use no electricity? Oh, oops, let me go back. So what we did was we came up with a hydraulic cylinder that's shown on the left of the screen. And basically, it is a piston like a bicycle pump that goes up and down. And as it goes up and down, it would pull on some, some cables that uh, ran along the, the patient's the ceiling of a bedroom and would go and attach to some slings that would be underneath, underneath her leg. So as the piston moved up and down, it would pull on these ropes that would move her legs backwards and forwards. And it was not a very expensive device, but how did it work? So let me show you schematically here. The source of the energy was the, a cold water uh, supply, regular tap water. And I'm going to illustrate pressure here with a red dot. Um, so think of this red dot as being water pressure. This, there's a bucket on the left, which is basically a, a hose pipe leading to their garden. The square to the, to the right and slightly up above the bucket is a simple valve that went backwards and forwards to control which way the piston was moving. OK, so let's start the process. Pressure comes along moves this valve to the left. It allows more pressure from this faucet to go up. Push that piston one way. It would also cause the, those two spool valves to change their position. More pressure would come along, push that valve back towards the right, and then continuing pressure from this cold water would push the piston back to where it started. So that thing was going up and down, moving this person's legs and it cost very little to do this. You could use the same technology for helping a person get in and out of a bath. You know, some people have difficulty with their legs. They're not strong enough to get out of a bath. And just connecting something to your cold water supply can allow you to do that. Another example, um, a colleague of mine wanted to measure blood flow in a person's leg. So if I said to somebody in the audience here, how would you measure blood flow in a person's leg? You would think of things like ultrasound or Doppler methods for looking at uh, blood flow, and those things are expensive. So if I said to you, be creative, think of a way of measuring how well your, your, your cardiovascular system is working, but do it very cheaply. This is what a colleague of mine did. Basically, he came up with 
something that looked like a bucket and a, and a pressure sensor. And in essence, you put your foot in this bucket. It's not really a bucket. It looks, it's, it's a container of water. You put your foot in this thing, and it's got a pressure sensor. And then you tell the person, bend your knees, you know, go up and down a few times, maybe 10 or 20 times. And what happens is if your blood supply to your foot is not working properly or the, or the blood can't get back up to your heart correctly, you can, you can detect those changes by simply looking at the volume of the water in the bucket. And I won't go through the details, but you, you can collect data, you can show a graph of how well this person's cardiovascular system is working simply by having them put their foot in this container of water and do some knee bends uh, to see, um, you know, are their valves working correctly? And if not, do they need some kind of clinical, clinical intervention? Here's a device developed in Northeast Ohio. It's a spin-off from the Cleveland Clinic, and it's a method for removing warts or moles on your skin. So if you go to the doctor right now, they take a scalpel and they may cut out this lesion on your skin and then they have to suture it up. So that takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Well, why, why spend all that time doing it? You can develop something that looks like a stapler, put it over the area of the skin that you want to treat, and you just click the stapler. It, it has two blades that remove the, the part of the skin you want to remove, and at the same time, it staples the skin. And it takes about five seconds. It's a cheap method, simple method, and fast. And, and uh, many clinicians um, like this because of, of the speed of, of its operation. All right, so this one you probably can't see, but it's, it's a, it's a um, problem um, that entails threading a guide wire through your femoral artery, up through the ischial um, artery, up through the aorta, and you want to get into the heart because you may want to deploy a, a stent there. So the question is, how can you get it to the right place? And these wires are slippery. Um, so the solution here is something that costs less than one dollar. It's a little plastic insert. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but basically, it's something that you clip onto the wire that the guide wire that you're putting in the patient, and it allows you to twist it left and right to guide it wherever you want to guide this wire. Very simple solution, low cost, but very effective. All right, some more biomedical examples. Let me talk about an unusual fluid. This is a fluid that um, can be like water, or if you change the magnetic field around it, it becomes very much like a solid. And the way it does it is it's, it's it's in essence a fluid, or think of an oil, that has very fine metal particles um, embedded in this. And let me say, this is not low cost solutions. I mean, these, some of these fluids are pretty expensive, but what I'm gonna share with you now are some other examples in biomedical engineering that, that solve uh, patient problems. So in this particular case, you have these very fine metal particles in a fluid, and it's like a, it's like a black oil, basically. If you apply a magnetic field around it, all those metal particles line up with each other and the fluid becomes stiff. Action. Okay, so you saw a liquid, the person applied a magnetic field, it became a solid, then released the magnetic field and it became a liquid again. So think, once again, think of being creative. Where can you use that in medicine? So here's one example. You can develop an artificial leg for a patient um, where the key issue here is when they put their foot on the ground on the, with their artificial leg, you don't want the leg to collapse. You want the leg to be stiff so that they can put weight on their leg. However, when they take the weight off their leg and you want to swing the leg forward to take the next step, you want the thing to, to swing like a free pendulum. So in essence, if you put the fluid in this uh, cylinder behind the knee, it can be stiff when you put, put weight on the leg and it can be very unstiff like a liquid when you take water, I mean, when you take a weight off the leg. So there's a, a, it's a fairly simple, I mean, as I said, these, these fluids are not necessarily as cheap as you would like them to be, but it solves a real patient problem, which is how do you get uh, amputee patients to walk around and feel comfortable with their artificial leg. A colleague of mine at the Cleveland Clinic um, worked on developing artificial hearts. So this is definitely not a value-driven engineering device. These are expensive devices. But the key thing here is, if you have an artificial uh, heart, shown here on the screen, and you want to move a piston left and right and left and right, and every time it moves either to the left or to the right, it's pushing blood either to the lungs or to the rest of your body. That's really what a heart does. The problem here is, on, with a mechanical device, as it's going left and right, it's, it's potentially um, experiencing friction. And the friction potentially 
causes wear particles. And the last thing you want in your heart, in your artificial heart, are little bits of wear particles, flakes of metal or dust that, that accumulate. So the question here is, how can you design something that moves left and right and yet has no friction? And the solution here is to use an unusual magnet. It's a magnet that has a spiral north pole and a spiral south pole. So the two metal surfaces don't actually touch each other. They are held apart by, this, by the magnetic fields. But when the motor turns left and right, because of the spiral magnetic field, it pushes the shaft either to the left or to the right. So it's a way of getting a heart to beat every second, going backwards and forwards, and yet not have to worry about wear particles. OK, once again, thinking of being creative here. Um, and you remember I said biomedical engineering is the intersection between different fields. Here's an example of astronomy intersecting with medicine. So bear with me while I explain this. But the guys way back when, you know, in days of Galileo and Copernicus and some of those individuals, when they were thinking about planets moving through, the, through, through, through uh, 3D space, they had to develop a lot of math that, we, that would explain that. So you can think of planets and moons rotating around each other. However, you can take the same concept and you can come up with basically ping pong balls, um, attach them to a patient with Velcro, for instance. In this case, uh, the ping pong balls really are representing where the person's pelvis is. So by measuring the 3D movement of, of, of spheres, you can tell what the person's skeleton is doing. So here's the pelvis. You can keep on doing, you can put ping pong balls on the person's um, thigh and represent where their femur is. You keep on going down to their shin or their tibia. So the essence here, the key part of this is by simply using something as simple as ping pong balls and filming how they're moving, you can understand where the skeleton is moving in 3D space. So you might say, well, that's all very well and good. So now I've, I see the connection between the math that astronomers used and looking at how the skeleton moves, but how does that help me design me medical devices? So here's an example where you want to design, in this particular case, a stent. And for those of you who don't know what a stent is, it's a metal cage that you put inside a blocked artery, and then you expand it, and it opens up the artery to allow blood to flow. If I go back to the example of a person with their foot in that bucket, what you want is blood flow. So you want the arteries to be open to allow the, the blood to go to the foot and then come back up again and go to the heart. And sometimes in order to get the blood to flow, you have to put these stents inside the, the arteries. Okay, so they, this is a mechanical device and you want to put this inside an artery. But remember, this artery is not like a hose pipe. This thing is expanding. Every time your heart beats, the arteries get wider. When you bend down or walk, this, your arteries are getting stretched backwards and forwards. So really what you need to know is how much stretch do I have to design into the system to allow the stent to perform properly without fracturing. So here's an example. I actually put these ping pong balls on myself. So this is my skeleton. Um, and you may be able to see a red stripe going down the right leg. That is a computer representation of my femoral artery. And, and I did different things like sitting down, standing up, and going up and down stairs. And on the computer, we are predicting how that artery is being deformed. How much is it being stretched and compressed? And with that information, you can go back to the design of these stents and design them so that they can be stretched 10, 10% or 20% or whatever you need. Okay, the last part of my presentation uh, deals with some challenges. There are many challenges. Once again, think of all those fields of engineering and all those clinical fields. Every intersection is an area of biomedical engineering that has challenges. So infection currently costs the United States about $45 billion per year treating patients who go to hospital and while they're there, they get infections. So let's look at this list scrolling. Wound closure, big, big issue. Can you make it faster? Coatings for burn patients. Spinal cord injuries, an un unsolved problem right now. Diabetic complications, all kinds of eye, kidney, um, foot problems with diabetic patients. And I've listed their creativity as a challenge because I want to emphasize this over and over again. And going back to what um, Mr. Klipfel said earlier this morning, you don't have to be the brightest person around, but you need to be creative because you could solve problems by thinking of them in a way that nobody else has thought of them before. 
And if you come up with a solution, the advantage with the United States patent system is you come up with a solution and you file a patent, you're the person who has uh, sole rights to that for the next 20 years. So even if somebody brighter comes along and says, oh yeah, I can solve that problem as well, the fact is if you came up with it first and you filed your patent, you have rights to commercialize that device. Challenges. Think about wheelchairs. You know, in my mind, wheelchairs are a fairly poor invention because you, it's fine if you're in a, in a room like this, but you go outside and you've got curbs to mount and you've got ditches to go over. A simple thing like a gap in the ground can be an insurmountable problem for a person in a wheelchair. So there should be better solutions than wheelchairs. Just thinking outside the box, maybe hovercrafts. You know, think about how you design a hovercraft. I know there are some energy issues, but man, that will solve a lot of problems with people in a wheelchair. So um, just you know, free thinking here. We need inventors. Other uses for fluids that can become a solid. What can you add to cell phones? Why not have your cell phone monitor your heart activity all day long? If there's a problem, have the cell phone call the doctor and say, I think uh, Jeremy over here has a problem with his heart. What sensor, sensors can you embed in your clothing? Yeah, there are many applications for that beyond medicine, even in the military. What tiny devices can help doctors? If you go to any doctor and you say, Could I ha what, what is the, what's the one thing you would like? Most of them would say, well, I have this device, but I like it to be smaller. And there are many applications for making things smaller. And suture, I mentioned wound closing. You know, for most procedures that they do, if you do a heart valve repair, the actual repair of the heart valve may take two or three minutes. The rest of the time is spent suturing. So there should be better ways of suturing. There's a huge, huge market for that. So with that, I'm going to conclude. I know there's um, some follow-up questions.